if I told you in advance that the sermon today was on authority, you might not have come. This week might have been a week where you thought, do you know what, I've always been wanting to visit my friend's church. I might go and visit them this week. It might have been that this morning you woke up and you were like, oh, do you know what, I feel too ill to come to church uh, today. Um, Because authority... Authority is not something that we're very excited about, and if we're honest, we got a, a problem with authority. Um, whatever way you grew up with, you're going to have a problem with authority. Like some of us, in certain situations, we like to hide from authority. Uh, sometimes we like there to be chaos rather than the order that authority brings. So some of us are, are like, in certain situations, the kids in the classroom that love it when the teacher's gone, and we're like, yeah, and we go nuts. And others are like the kid who, who's in the classroom sitting there going, no, miss will come back soon. Like, everyone stop, you know. And, and in different situations, we, we'd be different. Some of us really like there to be order. And sometimes then we, we like seeing authority bring order, but, but sometimes we can do that in a harsh way. So we've all got problems with authority in different ways. Either we just totally move away from authority or we use authority in too harsh a way. And, and that's why it is actually a really important topic because we've all been given authority by God. So if you're a human being, if you're an image bearer, you have got authority. So one of the biggest questions in your life has got to be, how am I supposed to use my authority? But not only that, but God has also placed us all under authority. So we've also got the question of, so how am I supposed to respond to authority? So that's what we're going to look at today. First, let me pray. Father God, we come under your authority now, realizing that we were already under it anyway, because you're our creator and you're our God. But we want to recognize your authority today and we want to recognize the authority of your word that in the Bible you've said what you want to say, you've said what's true, and you've said what we've got to obey and how we've got to live our lives. So please, Holy Spirit, help us as we see what you've written about how we're supposed to live our lives as image bearers. Help us to respond to it in the right way. Jesus, we look to you today as the perfect image of God, and we say, will you help us, Jesus, to become more like you? Amen. All right, let's turn to Genesis chapter 1, yeah? Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, right in the beginning. We're going to look at the first five verses to start off. So right at the beginning of the Bible... When God tells us how everything got made, how it all started, right? It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it says, if you're reading from the NIV, what does it say? It says, now the earth was, it gives two words, formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay, so there's something going on, but it's kind of hard to get our heads around, yeah? But there's this formless and empty earth. There's, there's darkness, and there's like a surface of the deep, and then you've got the Holy Spirit hovering over it. Some people say, like, this is it's almost like some kind of form of chaos uh, going on here. Uh, for sure, one thing we definitely know it's going on here is darkness, because can you see it there? It says, darkness was over the surface of the deep. And then look what God does. It says, and God said, let there be what? Light. Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. Okay, so, and it says, and he separated the light from the darkness. The first thing we see there is God uses his authority and he speaks and he brings light into what? Into into darkness. So before you've, you've got this earth where there's darkness and God uses his authority to bring light in. So the first time you see authority in the Bible, is it good or bad? Good. It's good, right? You want that, yeah? You want that light coming in the darkness. It's like when you're a kid and you're like, Mommy, I'm scared. Can you turn the light on? And your mum turns the light on. That's a good thing, yeah? Uh, um, authority on its own is not a bad thing. It, when it started off in the Bible, it was a, a good thing. Okay, now, then it says... Um, 
God called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day. So what God's done is he's created some kind of order. He's actually created some, some kind of order and he said, right, this is daytime and this is nighttime. So he's used his authority to bring order where there was some kind of like chaos, as some people say. So God uses authority to bring order, right? So order is a good thing, yeah? And, and authority is a good thing. But both of these things we can end up twisting and using them in a bad way or responding to them in a bad way. Let's go now to verse 26. We've looked at this many times over the last few weeks, haven't we? It says, Genesis 1, 26, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our, what does it say? Likeness. So we're made like God. And it says, So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the earth. So God created mankind in his own, what does it say? Image. In the image of God, he created them male and what? Female. Female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living thing that moves on the ground. So what's happening here? God's got authority. He makes mankind in his what? In his image. So you would expect mankind to also have what? Authority, you'd expect mankind to have authority, yeah? Um, and when we say mankind, it's pretty clear there, it's male and female. I heard some stupidness the other day from someone, wow, uh, I was so surprised, you know? And then basically saying how the man, the man is, is and then, oh, I don't, I don't even want to go there, but basically, um, <laughs> but you've got to understand, male and female made in the image of God, yeah? So, so we just got to understand that us men, we're a bit different to women. Ladies, you're a bit different to men. But we're both reflecting God. We're both reflecting God. And it wouldn't be right for either one of us to be like, well, we're the ones that are properly reflecting God because we're like masculine, isn't it? And then for ladies to be like, well, we're feminine, so we're the ones properly re representing God. Well, well, actually, what we see is to represent God, God, God made male and female. Okay. And, and both of them are made in the image of God, which therefore means both have what? Authority. Both have authority. Okay. Right. Check it out. You've been authorized by God according to, what's the verse where it says God blessed them and said be fruitful? I don't have verse numbers in my notes. Well, verse 28. Verse 28. Do you see that? God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. God's saying that to mankind. God's authorizing male and female to, to have authority over the earth and spread God's loving rule. So uh, put, your, put your hand up if you're a male. Uh, keep your hand up. Put your hand up if you're a female, but males still keep your hands up. Okay, right. Okay, all you guys, you've been authorized. You can put your hands down now. You've been authorized to spread God's loving rule all over the earth. God has actually blessed you and told you and commissioned you and said, rule over the earth for me. you got a ton of authority. That is a ton of authority, right? Uh, that's amazing. We got, we got that authority. Uh, it's amazing. Now, check it out. There's a difference between power and authority. You might remember me saying this a few weeks back when we looked at power, where power is your ability to influence something. You can push something over. That's, that's power. You can make someone smile. That's power. You can tidy your living room. That is power, bringing order to the chaos. Authority, authority is when you've been authorized to use that power. So authority is when you're told you actually have permission to use your power in this way. And that's really important because oftentimes we use our power in a way we're not supposed to, yeah? So we, we've all used our power in a way we're not supposed to. If, it, some of the easiest ways is to think back to school days and think about in the playground. There's probably plenty of times where you punched or kicked someone or, or called someone a name, yeah, um, or in your family being mean to someone. That is us using our power in a way we're not authorized, right? Um, 
But God has actually authorized us with specific ways of how to use our, our power. And that is the authority he's given us. Okay, so one of the reasons why it's important to realize we've been authorized by God to, to use our power is we often look to other people to use their power to make our lives better, right? And that is, let's, let's be honest, that is a big thing in Britain, right? Because we've all grown up in a welfare state and this is by no means meant to be uh, me arguing for or against the welfare state, yeah? This is merely me saying we're very used to thinking someone else in authority is supposed to do something about this, yeah? So right now, all the knife crime going on, what do people say? What, what are the police doing? There you go. What are the people in authority doing? What are the politicians doing? Now, these, these can be legitimate questions, but sometimes we forget, wait a minute, I've been authorized to spread God's loving rule. What am I doing? What am I saying about it? What am I doing? Because I've been authorized to spread his loving rule. So sometimes we look to other people to lead when we have actually been authorized. Let's jump ahead to chapter 2, right? Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To work it and... Genesis 2.15, and take care of it. He's been in told to work it and take care of it, right? And Adam has been authorized to work and take care of the, of the garden. And, and you could translate the Hebrew words that are used here as to serve and protect. And we come on to more on that in, in another session. That's what Adam's been authorized to do. This is how he's supposed to use his power to serve and protect. And all of us have been authorized to use our power to serve and protect. And like I say, we'll look at that more in another session. But now, bearing that in mind, Adam was supposed to protect the garden. He was supposed to serve in the garden. Jump ahead to Genesis chapter 3. Now, Genesis chapter 3 is the, is the proper sad chapter, yeah, where the devil comes in, tempts Eve, Adam and Eve sin, and look, look what the devil says to Eve in Genesis 3, verse 5. Yeah? And we looked at the story the other week, so we're just going to just look at a couple of highlights here. It, the devil says to Eve, For God knows that when you eat from it, and what's he talking about? Eating what? The fruit, yeah? Uh, the forbidden fruit. When you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like who? God, knowing good from evil. The devil... It, it, look what he's doing here. He's tempting Eve to basically be her own God. He's saying, you'll be like God. And, and, and he's tempting her to be her own authority. Because he's saying, don't listen to the authority God said. Be your own authority. That's how the devil's tempting, tempting her. And the thing is, we get tempted the same way to be our own boss. We get tempted to build our own little kingdoms instead of God's kingdom. We get tempted to do what we think we want to do rather than what God tells us to do. And then look at the next verse. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Okay, so Eve goes against God's authority here, blatantly goes against God's authority and take, takes the fruit, yeah? She has not been authorized to eat this fruit. And then Adam fails to use his authority because he'd been authorized to do what? To protect. And right now he's not protecting his wife. He's not protecting the garden. He's not protecting God's words that was supposed to be passed on to everyone else. What, what Adam's doing is he's not using his authority and he's not using his power the way God authorized him to. You could say Adam has abdicated his authority. He's, he's just said, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna bother. I'm not gonna bother fighting. Tragic, tragic and, and really sad. In some ways, what Adam's done is um, there's been many stories about this and many movies and it's a kind of a theme that goes through loads of stories throughout history but there was there was one story 
where you know the English were being really cruel to the Scots many many years ago and and there was one guy who was going to rise up and fight against them and he was relying on another one of the Scottish kings or one of the Scottish tribal leaders to help him and it was like together we can do this and then when they turned up on the battlefield discovered that this Scottish tribal leader had decided to not bother coming out to fight and so they lost the battle and it's really sad that sense of betrayal and what I thought we were going to fight this together and that's what you see happening here Adam should have been standing up for what was right and protecting his wife and saying Eve this ain't right but instead he doesn't he doesn't use his authority he's just quiet doesn't do nothing terrible but if we're honest we regularly do the same we regularly don't use our authority to spread God's loving rule sometimes we just watch the devil spreading his rule just going on and sometimes we might even think well I'm glad that's not happening in my home yeah which is a bit like the king in the Old Testament you got the prophecy of all these bad things that were going to happen after he died and he's like oh well at least it ain't in my life you know a terrible way to respond to stuff but that's how we get tempted to be like I'm, I'm not going to spread God's love and rule we never think of it that way do we like sometimes you might even think I'm just being polite by keeping quiet I'm just being polite and, and living a quiet life sometimes we don't share the gospel with people who are going to hell you know and and that's a that's an example of the same kind of thing not spreading God's loving rule even though we've been authorized to do that so let's go to verse 16 and let's see what happens as a result of sin coming into the world like this God says to the woman he says I will make your pains in childbearing very severe with painful labor you will give birth to children so he's saying there's going to be a consequence now that sins come into the world childbirth is going to be very severely painful and then he says as if that wasn't bad enough your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you uh, the net bible translates this in quite a helpful way I think where they say uh, you, you will want to control your husband and he will domineer you. And I think that's what's going on here. God's saying, now that sin is infecting you, Eve, you're going to, she hadn't quite been called Eve yet, but he's like, you're, you're going to want to control Adam. I put Adam in your life as an authority figure. Now, we've got to remember, up to this point, authority's been good, right? So the idea of saying Adam's an authority figure isn't a bad thing forget of everything you've seen in history of how bad certain societies have become through this idea of negative male leadership we're talking about a, a, a good authority and if you want to know what that kind of good authority that Adam was supposed to be like you just jump ahead to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament where it says husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so we see that authority is like a sacrificial authority that says, I'm going to make sacrifices for you. So, so that's how authority is supposed to be. And, and God's saying to the woman, now you're going to want to control your husband in an unhealthy way. Right? And then he's saying, he's saying and, and your husband is going to domineer you. So he's going to use his authority in an unhealthy way. So we see here, God's saying there's going to be problems with how humans respond to authority people want to control the authority in their life yeah we've all felt that with our bosses haven't we wanting to control our bosses right and and then but the other thing is he's saying people in authority are going to struggle with being too domineering and how they use their authority using it in a in a harsh way so we've got two problems here with authority we respond to it badly and we use it badly so please turn to Romans chapter 13 because I find Romans 13 so helpful right because I just naturally have grown up with an aversion to authority listen I remember like being on the green as a kid with a bunch of other kids and seeing you know on Danbury Avenue and seeing a police car and then us all being like let's run and just like running for ages so that the police would chase us 
you know, we've done nothing wrong, but just to wind up the police. Uh, it was just this natural anti or yeah, nev never mind, oh yeah, let's let the police do their job serving and protecting, keeping everyone safe. Instead, it's just like, oh, police, you know? And I still remember the first time I heard the phrase, I smell bacon, you know? And I thought, that's heavy, yeah. Like, that, what a wonderful thing to say to police, you know? Um, and, you know, it's just this anti-authority <coughs> culture um, that, that we have. And I've grown up hearing all kinds of stuff about the council and everything. So, so I found I have to go to scripture and I have to say, what does the Bible say about authority? What does God say about it? Because I don't trust my own, guess what word I'm going to say? A. Begins with A. I don't trust my own assessment about authority. Okay, so look at Romans chapter 13. This is deep. Verse 1, it says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority, no authority except that which God has established. Now, I'm just going to read that out again, just so we got that clear. There is no authority except that which God has established. Any authority in your life has been established by God, even if you don't think it's great authority. Yeah. It's been established by God, and it's saying, so we've got to be subject to it. That's quite deep, right? And then it says, the authorities that exist have been established by God. So all the authorities in our life have been established by God, right? That means authority in your family has been established by God. Authority in your church has been established by God. Authority in your neighborhood and in your country has been established by God. Now, that's going to make all of us feel a bit uncomfortable if we're honest with ourselves. <laughs> We've got to be subject to all those authorities. And that's hard, right? That's, 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 that's hard for us. And then it says, it says this, Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority, right? We've all done this. We've all rebelled against authority. Is rebelling against what God has instituted. Wow. So, so that's saying when we rebel against authority, what we don't realize is we're actually rebelling against God. Right? Have you ever rebelled against the council or against the police or a teacher or a boss or a pastor? Like, have you ever done any kind of rebellion? Even if it's just been in your heart, you know, Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, we say, well, that counts too, right? And, and so that, that is actually rebellion against God. It's actually rebellion against God. Wow, and then it says, and those who do so will bring something on themselves. What does it say? They will bring judgment on themselves. So when we rebel, we're actually bringing judgment on, on ourselves. Wow, wow. And then it says, look at verse three. For rulers hold no terror for those who do what is right, but for those who do wrong. And then check out this bit. This bit is so important for our culture. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? So that's a question for us right now. Do you, guys, do you want to be free from the fear of people in authority in your life? And then it says, then do what is right and you will be commended. Right. I'm expecting some of you to think, hang on a minute. <laughs> so don't worry, don't worry. I feel you. I'm with you. Don't, I think it will be explained. Okay. Firstly, one of the reasons we respond to authority badly is because of fear. It, it, it says there, do you want to be free from fear of the one one authority? Um, it's showing us we have a natural fear towards authority. There's a reason for that fear. There's two reasons. There's two reasons, yeah. Uh, one of them... And the big reason is, and can anyone guess what it is? It's to do with relationships. Remember we talked about relationships and the problem with our relationships. There's something that came in at the fall in our relationships that messes up our relationships. It's shame. It's shame. Yeah. It's shame. Now, shame makes us fear authority, right? Because it says there, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority, then do what is right. We all have this sense of shame that we've done things wrong and that we're doing things wrong. 
right? And that, that brings shame, okay? Now, now the thing is, the thing is, that means when we see an authority figure, you get this pang of shame. You get this, this pang of shame because you know you've done things wrong. You know, like uh, those of you who, are, who drive, you know when you're driving and suddenly you realize there's a police car behind you, you have this, this feeling, don't you? You have this kind of like sort of feeling goes over you, a dread. And you're thinking, what are all the things I've done wrong? Because you know you're not a perfect driver. You might have been slagging everyone else as you were driving, like as if you are a perfect driver. But as soon as you see that authority figure, you're like, whoa, wait a minute. What have I done? What might I get in trouble for? Or yeah, I find just walking around Roehampton, if suddenly I see a policeman there, I'm suddenly, I get this feeling of suddenly like, oh, you know, and it's a feeling of shame. That's, that's what it is, and fear. It's fear and shame. Like, there could be something I've done wrong that this person could get me in, in trouble for. When you was in school, some of your problems with your teachers and authority figures was because of shame, of feeling a sense of shame of, oh, the teacher's here now, and I know I've, I've done something wrong. And that shame leads to fear, and fear often leads to anger which is why people get angry with authority figures. Okay, now, there's also another reason. With authority figures, what also happens, some, some authority figures treat you a certain way, and so then you feel shame because of how they treat you, yeah? Maybe you've been stopped by the police so many times, and they treat you a certain way, that now when you see the police, you just kind of feel this kind of shame and this kind of like fear, like, oh, I'm going to be in trouble now because of how they're misusing their authority. It, it, it's hard. Even with your boss at work, there can be the sense of shame. I had this boss who was really good at putting everything in order and it needed to happen. And it was interesting seeing how angry my colleagues got with my boss. And I think part of it was shame. Because when my boss was saying, I need to see your lesson plans, people were realizing... We don't do lesson plans. We just turn up and try and teach on the fly. We don't really care about it that much. And there's that sense of shame that leads to fear. I'm going to get in trouble. That then leads to anger. I'm annoyed at my boss and start gossiping about her and all this kind of stuff. So, so here's the thing. The good thing is this is easily remedied by Jesus, right? Because Jesus at the cross, he took our shame. He took our shame. He took our shame. And not only that, because we know we're made in the image of God, the more we get we're made in the image of God, the less shame we feel. Which means when you see that authority figure, even if that authority figure uses their authority in a bad way, and you get that feeling of shame and fear, you can replace it with, hold up. Jesus took my shame on the cross. He took all my wrong on the cross. I don't need to be afraid Plus, I'm made in the image of God. And even if this authority figure doesn't get properly that I'm made in the image of God, I know I'm made in the image of God. And so, therefore, I'm now going to respond this way. And if you, I want, I'd really like everyone to remember this, right? What, how, do we help? What do we, how do we respond to authority figures that aren't perfect? This is what you do. I got this from Jack Miller, right? You support them in their weaknesses. You learn from their strengths and you support them in their weaknesses. You learn from their strengths and you support them in their weaknesses. That is a wonderful way of responding to authority because all authority in your life, apart from God's, is going to be flawed, right? All authority is going to mess up and do it wrong, right? And, and so what we do is we say, well, this authority figure, there's lots of strengths they've got and I can really learn from those strengths. And, and I can bring, let them bring order into my life that I need. They've got some weaknesses as well. I'm going to support them in their weaknesses. I'm going to help them with their weaknesses. And here's the, way, here's the way we do that. The only way you can really do that is by first realizing that feeling of shame I get that leads to fear, that leads to anger at authority figures in my life. I'm going to look at that through the lens of the cross. Jesus has taken away my shame. I'm going to look at it through the lens of being in the image of God. I'm in the image of God. And, and then that takes away all the baggage I've got about authority. 
and now I can say, I'm going to support you. I mean, you, obviously you wouldn't say to an authority figure, I'm going to support you in your weakness. I notice that you get really stressed when you're under pressure and you kind of bark orders at all of us. I'm going to support you in that. Obviously, you wouldn't say that. That would be a passive aggressive way yeah, of showing anger. To, to, in, instead, it's like we're like, yeah, I'm just committed to supporting them in those situations. Okay. So, but what the Bible also teaches us, and we haven't got enough time to go now, but the Bible also teaches us elsewhere that those of us in authority, which is how many of us in this room? All of us. All of us are in authority, right, to spread God's love and rule. So all of those of us in authority have got a tendency to use that authority in a harsh way. And God wants us to use it in a gentle, loving way. Yeah? That's, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So we've also got to bear in mind not just how we relate to people in authority, but realize we've got authority and we've got to use that authority in a, in a gentle way. Okay, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. Genesis 3, 17. And it says, it says, to Adam, so remember, God's talked to Eve and he said, look, now you're going to have these relational problems, you and your husband. And then to Adam, he says, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. So what's happened here is, is God is saying, Adam, the problem is you, what does it say? What verb is it? You You listened to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife, yeah, and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you should not eat. So again, it's not a problem with listening to his wife, it's a problem of listening to his wife in a context where God had said something different, and Adam chose to listen to what his wife said instead of what God said. In other words, Adam chose to listen to choose a different authority to God's authority and say, I'm going to do what my wife said. Now you might think, oh, he's so silly, it's so obvious. But all of us, all of us are constantly listening to different authorities and being brainwashed by them, being brainwashed by them. Uh, we, we talked before about all the different uh, influences in our life. We said you got sin influencing you and talking to you. What else you got? The world the flesh and the devil. All, the, all these voices come in at us and they come at us through clever means. So I studied, I studied marketing, right? Uh, when I say I studied it, like it, I, I, I've done a few courses and I did business studies, A-level. And like in, in marketing, it's deep how if you want to if you wanna advertise a car or a holiday, you don't just take a photo of a car or a photo of a holiday, yeah? If you want a man to buy the car or a man to pay for the holiday, you have a picture of a man with a very attractive woman. And somewhere you have the idea of a car, right? And the reason why is because it, it affects the way your brain processes that information, that a man sees the advert and he just associates buying a car with having an attractive woman with him, right? Okay, and, and, and that, is, that is a technique that marketer, marketeers learn how to, how, to, uh, how to sell stuff, how to trick people's brains into associating things a certain way. Now, how many adverts do you listen to or watch in a day or in a week? That's a whole lot. That's a whole lot of people, intelligent people, who have, got, have been gifted in a certain way that they can work out how to brainwash you into thinking certain things when you see or hear certain things. People have even done it to the noise of a ring pull on a drink. So there's a certain brand of drink that you might think of when you hear that, that ring pull, right? It's deep how deep it goes, which means when someone tells me I'm not being catechized at the moment, no one's catechizing me. No one's taking me through the urban catechism or anything. I could say, what do you mean you're not being catechized? Of course you're being catechized. If you're living and breathing on this planet, you're being catechized every day by all the voices out there, by the world, by the flesh, 
by indwelling sin, by the devil. We're all being catechized. Catechized means instructed. We're all being instructed um, constantly, which means we've got to be really careful. How much are we listening to God's authority? Are we really listening to it and submitting to it and obeying it? Right, then look what happens in verse 15. God then says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Okay. Anyone know who God's talking to now? It's the serpent, right? So now God's addressing the devil. And first off, he's saving Eve because he's saying, I'm going to put enmity, which means hatred and hostility. I'm going to put hostility between you and the woman. In other words, I'm going to change the woman's heart so she don't like you no more, Mr. Devil. Because she was liking the devil, listening to him and being like, yeah, sounds good. And so God's like, I've got to change this woman's heart. I've got to put some hostility there. He's saving her. And that's what God does with us. It's amazing. He says, listen, you love the devil too much. You love the world too much. You love the flesh too much. You love sin too much. I've got to change your heart. And then he's saying, the woman's going to have an offspring. And what's this offspring going to do to the devil? Crush his head. Okay, so, so he's prophesying in the future there's going to come an offspring of the woman who's going to crush the devil's head, and that's Jesus. But it also says, and he will strike his heel, because it, it looks like Jesus is kind of going to get wounded in the process. And that's the cross. That's what happened at the cross. That's what happened at the cross. So God's saying, here's how I'm going to solve this problem. It's by sending someone who will stamp on the devil's head. And years later, he sends his son Jesus. And Jesus willingly comes, and at the cross deals with all this mess of sin. And that's why earlier we were saying that's how he helps us with our authority, right? Because of what he's done at the cross, he deals with that shame that we feel about authority. Yeah? So this week, you don't need to be scared of your boss at work or your teacher at school or whoever it is. You don't need to be scared of them. You don't need to feel shame. Sure, you've done things wrong. I bet if your boss saw how you spend every minute of your time or your school teacher saw that, or certain shortcuts you're taking at work, they might be displeased. But what if, instead of focusing on that, because if you focus on that, you will then have fear, and you will respond to your boss in either an angry way or a people-pleaser way, where you're trying to get in your boss's good books. But if instead of that, and this is my advice to everyone for this week, think, Wait a minute, Jesus took all my shame and all my wrong on the cross. In the Father's eyes, I'm holy and blameless. In his sight, he's pleased with me. I'm in Christ. He looks at me and says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Ah, I'm freed up of the shame. I'm freed up of the fear. That is now going to change the way I respond to authority. Because now I will just find that the way I work for my boss now is going to be different. There's not going to be passive aggressive stuff there. There's not going to be people pleaser stuff there. Instead, I'm just going to be like, I want to use my authority to serve God and spread God's loving rule. And I want to support my boss. I'm going to help my boss. You might even get stopped by police. And you get that horrible feeling and you might remind yourself, wait a minute, Jesus took all my shame. Even if I had done something wrong, Jesus has taken my shame. Jesus has done right in my place. So it says in Romans, if you don't want to be afraid, then do what is right. I can't do what's right all the time. But I know Jesus has done right in my place. Oh, great. So I'm freed up from that shame. And I'm made in the image of God. I'm made wonderfully and fearlessly in his image. And so now I might know this particular policeman might have issues. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to support him in his weaknesses. And it's going to change my approach to him where I'm actually going to be trying to help him, even if he's got attitude with me. And I'm thinking, I'm going to support him in his attitude because he's got a problem. Poor bloke. He probably don't know he's made in God's image. He probably don't know about the cross. But I do. And I'm not going to let him define who I am because I know who I am. He said I'm going to support him in his weakness. Okay, so Jesus is the guy who stamps on the devil's head, deals with our authority problems, Right? Let's turn lastly to Matthew 28 and we see what Jesus then says about authority. Because, because 
In Genesis 1, we're given what's called the cultural mandate, where he says, go and rule over the earth. But later, Jesus says something that sounds a bit like the cultural mandate, but is a little bit different. And it's because when Jesus comes, human beings aren't living as proper image bearers, right? So Jesus is like, we've got to change that. We've got to get everyone back into God's image, right? Which is what, because anyone remember, what's the name for the process of helping people become more like the image bearers? Sanctification. And the actual name of what we call we do with one another is called discipleship. Discipleship, helping one another become more like Christ. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them. This is after the cross. He's died, he's resurrected, and he says, all, and what word does he use? Authority. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. He's all about authority, right, Jesus. He's got all the authority. And then because of this, he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Right, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. Oh, I really wanted to preach a sermon on this verse, but I, we, we've come to the end of our time here. What I do want to say from this verse is Jesus has authorized you to make disciples. He's authorized you to make disciples. Yeah, you have been authorized to do it. You might say, no, not me, I'm not good enough, right? But Jesus has authorized you. How can you say you're not good enough? He's actually said, go and make disciples. So he's decided that in Christ, you are good enough. You might say, I'm not powerful enough, or I don't know enough, or or what have you. But look what he says at the end. He says, and surely I am what? With you. There you go. (laughs) I am with you always, yeah, to the very end of the age. So he promises, I'll be with you. I'll be with you as you make disciples. It's like we saw before with our power. We get our power from who? This Holy Spirit. And so when Jesus says, I'm with you, he's going through the presence of the Holy Spirit, he's going to be with us as we make disciples. Now, Pete doesn't feel he's able to make disciples. He still goes to church, but when it comes to making disciples, he kind of puts his head in the sand thinking he's not good enough. Um, he's a bit like the bloke who buried his bag of gold. Remember the parable or the talents or the bags of gold and one one bloke buries his in the ground right uh, he's he's afraid god's not god's not happy with him about that now now pete needs to know that god has authorized him to make disciples and that god is very pleased with him through christ and that god will help him to make disciples and that pete is operating out of fear but perfect love casts out fear the fear comes from shame Jesus has dealt with our shame at the cross, allows us to experience God's love and then say, yeah, I'm authorized to make disciples. But then Sarah, on the other hand, Sarah, on the other hand, she's, all, she's really into making disciples, but she won't come under the authority of our local church. She's like, no, I just like to go about doing my thing led by, led by the Spirit. She's not operating under any authority. She's a lone ranger. Here's the scary thing about Sandra, Sarah. Sandra, Sarah. I normally use Sandra as a name, don't I? And this week I thought I changed it to Sarah, and in my mind I've gone back to Sandra. It's always Pete and Sandra. <laughs> if anyone joins our church called Pete or Sandra, like, we've got to really change stuff. Sarah, yeah. The thing is, the thing is Sarah is um, Sarah's not being a lone ranger. Think back to the garden. Who's Sarah listening to? The devil. Be your own boss. Listen to the devil. Okay. But then there was a Roman centurion in the Bible who came to Jesus and he said, he's like, I get it, Jesus, how you roll because I am under authority and I've got men under my authority. And, 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 and Jesus really liked this guy, <laughs> you know, because of the faith he had. And also it appears Matthew writes that story to, to let us understand something about authority We're supposed to make disciples as people who are under authority and people who are using our authority to spread God's loving rule to others. That's that's what Jesus wants us to do. It's one of the reasons why he died on the cross, because mankind wasn't using his authority properly. And Jesus comes to sort that out and to help us use our authority, to help us sit under authority and to use authority properly to spread God's 
loving rule. We've been authorized to make disciples. Let's pray for his help to do it now. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you that at the cross you've dealt with our shame. You've dealt with our fear. You've dealt with our sin. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. And Jesus, you are our Lord and King. And we confess, oh, we listen to the devil too much. We, we, we're our own authority too much. We just constantly do what we want to do and, and build our own kingdoms instead of building your kingdom. Forgive us, Jesus. Help us to submit to your lordship. Holy Spirit, help us to make disciples. Help us as image bearers to become more like the image of Christ. Help us to go and make disciples of all kinds of people. Father God, we come before you as your children. We thank you for adopting us. Thank you that perfect love casts out fear. And we don't need to be afraid that you're displeased with us because actually, because we're in Christ and we've got Jesus' record of right, you are pleased with us. We thank you for that, Dad. And we pray that you would help us as obedient children to make disciples and bring glory to your name and to spread the word so that more people would come into your family and experience your wonderful Father heart. Amen.